Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. I hope you had a restful and very non-anxious night last night uh, uh, and a good hike this morning or walk on the beach or some, some good strong coffee and uh, had, a, um, had a relaxing time. In the spirit of this conversation, we've envisioned this morning session to be a highly interactive one uh, with some, some brisk prompts that will direct and redirect the uh, discussion. We've got a tight schedule and we're, we're gonna um, try to keep it. I'll be primarily the engineer uh, to keep the trains running on time, and that'll be European style, not Amtrak style. Uh, our, our conversation will focus on the stresses of college admissions, collegiate learning, and the search for belonging, as well as extracurricular pressures. We're going to be joined by four people who I will introduce briefly at the appropriate moment. Just a brief tale to start. Uh, I raised my children in, the relatively well -to in a relatively well-to-do town on the North Shore of Boston, and many of the stories and conversations about student success we had took place on the soccer, soccer sidelines of youth soccer games. Uh, in that town, like many towns in New England, parents were obsessed with getting their kids into elite colleges. Uh, and they began talking about that as early as the eighth grade. Uh, so on the soccer sidelines, you would hear lots of boastful complaining about the demands of driving their children from the so club soccer game to the violin practice, to the science fair, to any of the five or six humanitarian projects they were working on to get their resumes padded for their uh, admission to an Ivy League school. Uh, and it seems like they all wanted to get into Ivy League schools. Uh, but here was the catch. For parents of my generation, a little bit older, we had about a one in ch three chance of getting into an Ivy League school. For children today, it's less than one in 20. So a lot of these children were being set up uh, and their parents were investing in a future that they would not reach. In many ways, they were being set up to fail their parents' dreams uh, in that race to success. Uh, well, none of those eighth grade children that I watched play youth soccer with my son ended up playing major league soccer or playing in the Boston Symphony Orchestra. A few of them did get into the Ivy League, but the most acclaimed of the eighth graders in my son's eighth grade class was a satirical young man named Bo Burnham, who launched a career with some rather foul-mouthed comic sketches on YouTube, and just recently was able to direct his first movie called Eighth Grade. Anyone seen it? Uh, you may have seen it. He was a candidate for the recent Academy Award. It's about the anxieties and insecurities of being young and curating a social uh, media identity uh, when reality and the pressures uh, of being an adolescent are overwhelming. So it's ironic, I think, that the most successful survivor of that drive for success in that era was somebody uh, who made his fame by helping unmask the pressures uh, and, and the challenges and the pretense that he was living with. So I'm going to encourage you to think of our session this morning as a conversation with friends along the sideline of a soccer game. But let's try to fill this one with more empathy, more discernment, uh, more discernment about what would be wise advice for the young, and in the spirit of uh, Tim Eatman, more imagination. So we're going to have several prompts uh, and some table conversation. Our first prompt comes from Tim Loomer, who serves as a headmaster at Providence School, which is a local academy in Santa Barbara. Uh, he's a former math teacher and coach and just recently finished a doctorate in educational leadership. Tim? Mm. Mm. Just stand there. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm very grateful to be here, so thank you. I am grateful for you being here. Um, I think this is a very important topic that you guys are thinking about and dis discussing. So I work at a Christian school, and as a Christian, I have heard many sermons over the years around stress and anxiety. From Matthew, Christ told us that we should not be anxious about anything. And then Paul and Philippians followed that off, up with, don't be anxious with anything. So I know as individuals, we are called to do that. But sometimes I wonder, as we work as organizations and institutions, do we set up processes that create stress and anxiety in others? Should we as Christians be looking at our role in creating stress and anxiety for others 
in addition to thinking about how do we reduce stress and anxiety in our own lives. So I think that what you are here and talking about is great, and I applaud you for that. Several years ago, I was actually hired for my role by Dr. Winter. He was the, um, the president of Westmont College for 25 years, and he retired and was one of the founding people behind Providence Hall. And we had a great discussion about what makes the difference in the classroom. Is it the student or is it the teacher? And I came from a public school background, and I thought it was the teacher. Because the teacher brings the ideas, the creativity, and plans. And he strongly felt like it was the student. And so I think a part of your discussion as college admissions people and people that are thinking about college is that you really, at the end of the day, want to bring the best students into your classrooms. And so in a way, you're going to set up your processes to try to screen for that. As I'm sure is an unintended result, that is going to lead to anxiety and stress for those who want to get into your institutions. So it's a very challenging thing that you're trying to do. Um, in preparation for what I am going to say, I thought this might be an interesting thought to, to share. Sometimes I feel like we ask our graduating high school students to be the educated, interesting, engaged, and experienced adults that we are not. <laughs> and um, I, I think that we set these expectations that we can't, as adults, meet. So it's understandable how stress gets in there. I think that as you're thinking, you need to think about both the parent and the student. Mark was saying he felt like it starts in eighth grade. I actually think it starts around second grade. I think parents get about kinder and first grade free from the stress of college. And then in second grade, they start worrying about, is my child getting the grade in math that they need to in order to be successful? So I think it starts that early. I think parents feel like the game has changed since they applied for college. When I applied, it was very simple. I went to, I had three schools I applied to, but now it's a much more complex, so I think the parents have the stress. On the student side, I think that the stress for them begins in middle school. Locally here, our schools have academies, and we have open enrollment, so not only are the parents thinking about what high school is my child gonna attend in town here, but they're also thinking about what academy is my child going to get into. When they get into those academies, there's about 30 students that are selected for those. They begin in their freshman year taking AP courses. I am still shocked that we think a 14-year-old student is ready to take AP physics. That is shocking to me. They then feel like over their high school years, they need to take as many AP physics courses as they can. They will try to game the system. They will try to take courses for credit, no credit, so that it doesn't impact their GPA because they took an, a course that's not weighted. They will do the craziest things that I think are counter to what you guys are working for, which is a liberal arts education. You want that child to take a sport. You want that child to take an art course. You want that child to be in a creative writing course. It's going to form them into an adult that is going to be a positive contributor to our culture and society. So, as I think about it, what are the things that we do? So these are the things that I think lead to a recipe for stress. We ask the students to take the most rigorous courses possible, to get the highest grades possible, to compete for these against all of their peers so that they come out number one in their course, in their class, to have a rich and diverse set of experiences, to conclude all of this with a killer set of college application essays and letters of recommendations. We expect them to have started some type of nonprofit organization that has mm -hmm. impacted the people in another country. And we want for them to earn enough scholarship money to make this work for them financially. So sometimes, again, it feels like we're asking our graduating high school students to be the educated, interesting, engaged, and experienced adults that we are not. So my question is this, as organizations who value individuals and a liberal arts education, organizations who do not approach life as a set of boxes to check, who value experiences, and we understand that formation is both short and long term, what steps can we take to help students and parents who apply to the institution to decrease their levels of stress over the application process? How can we further influence people at other institutions to think similarly? Because I know this is a problem that's not just with the people that are involved here. Christ called us to have no anxiety. 
And I think we need to think about how we can reduce anxiety in others. Okay, good. Thank you, Tim. He's giving you a good question. We're going to give you about 10 minutes at your table. You can applaud. Yeah. We're going to give you about 10 minutes at your table to discuss it. Shift it. We're going to shift to another track. And at this time, uh, Chris Heckley, who you know as the director of the Gaty Institute, who, who also is well known on our campus for leading um, uh, students on international study tours with his wife, Sherry, um, is going to give a student's perspective. So I'm here in lieu of uh, one of the students who was with us on a semester abroad program last fall. Um, she's in class right now, so she opted not to skip class to be with you all, which was, <laughs> I think, a good choice. Um, what I'll have to share comes from a paper that she wrote uh, at the end of the semester last fall. And um, I'm inclined to file this under the heading of when students learn exactly as we'd want them to, and it still breaks them. Okay, that's, that's sort of the category I'd file this under. So I'll just read some excerpts from that paper, and, uh, and then we'll go on. One of my goals for college was stepping outside of my comfort zone, engaging with ideas and with people that aren't common to my everyday experience. This semester abroad has taken that idea to the extreme and constantly reminded me that I don't actually experience or even understand a vast majority of the human experience. Perhaps the most striking reminder of my experiential limitations occurred when I read Andrea Levy's essay, This Is My England. The subject of the essay is Levy's sense of Englishness. She focuses on how being a second generation immigrant from Jamaica separated her from the, quote, white children who would never have to grow up to question whether they were English or not, end quote. Near the end of her essay, Levy says, quote, I want to belong to anywhere but this place where I am made to feel like an outsider not welcome, definitely not welcome at all, end quote. Personally, feeling excluded is my least favorite feeling on earth. While I've experienced moments of exclusion throughout my life, I have never felt unwelcome or excluded from a place or people because of my background or the color of my skin. I can read all I want about Levy's experience, but at the end of the day, the experience still isn't mine and I will never be able to fully understand or relate to it, even though it's one experienced by countless people around the globe immigrants, refugees, and racial or ethnic minorities. Throughout the semester, I continued to encounter or read about people whose experiences I can never fully grasp. I want to continually learn and grow in my understanding of the world around me, and the idea that I can never completely understand the daily struggle or experience of such large groups of people makes me uncomfortable. My first response to this discomfort was to lean into it. I wanted to learn more, to think more, and to understand more. I wanted to continue thinking about national identity and racial tension, so I bought a book called The Good Immigrant, containing 21 essays written by either first-generation or second-generation immigrants to Britain. However, during the last leg of our semester, my response changed. I utterly disengaged. I was so overwhelmed with discomfort, I shut down. I essentially stopped journaling, and I slowly lost the balance between engaging in uncomfortable things and processing them. By the end of the semester, I had been trying to engage my discomfort for months, but hadn't taken nearly enough time to process the things I was learning. After seeing two difficult plays about race relations in London, I couldn't talk or think about the racial or multicultural aspects of the plays without feeling emotionally and mentally exhausted. My gradual realization this semester is twofold. First, being reminded of how many people and things I don't understand about this world we live in is uncomfortable, and I should lean into that. Second, engaging discomfort is only helpful if I give myself the time and space to process and learn from it. If I don't clarify my thoughts through writing or engage them in discussion, powerful ideas and experiences pile up together in my head and lead to existential crises instead of growth. I'm grateful for my experiences this semester and how much I've already learned, but I'm also excited to go home, curl up on the couch with my dog, and process it all. 
Well, as Chris, uh, Chris shared, we know students can uh, grow through their challenges, but they can also be overwhelmed by, by fear and by discomfort. So the question we'd like you to reflect on at the table is how can we allow them and encourage them to take risks and even fail without fear or discouragement about their future? But it's clearly related to many of the things we've talked about, and that's the sense of belonging. And that's going to be introduced to us by Angela Damore, who is the Director of Campus Life at Westmont College, who works quite a bit at the borderlines between academics and, um, and the co-curriculum. So, uh, Angela. Yeah, so I think as humans, we all have a pretty deep need, desire to belong. And I think that can be an interesting situation in college where things are constantly changing, right? So you're coming in, you don't know the community, you're changing classes every semester, maybe you're studying off campus for a bit, but things are constantly changing and so that element of belonging is constantly changing. I oversee some of our first year experience and our orientation team and the first question we always ask our candidates who want to be welcoming new students is, tell us about your own orientation experience. And I always say, it's okay, you can tell me the good and the bad and the ugly because I know it's all there. And I would say at least half of those students who are applying, the first thing they say is, I was so worried when I came to college. That first week, that first day, I was so worried. And I'll say, tell me more. And they say, well, I was afraid I wouldn't belong. I was afraid I wouldn't fit in. I was afraid I wouldn't make friends. Um, any sort of version of that. And I'm surprised by how many of them come in with both the fear and the expectation that I need to make this work and connect right away. So there's a strong desire. We, we had a panel discussion with some students on Wednesday with a workshop we hosted. And one of the students who's just a delightful student, he's very well respected by his peers. He's been really successful academically. Um, he said something that really struck me. Those of you who are here may remember this, but he said, you know, I look at uh, as I'm walking around campus, he said, I look at groups of students together. Maybe it's a group of athletes or musicians or theater students. And he said, and you know, I always just feel a little bit on the outside. I always just feel a little bit on the periphery. And you know, I heard that and then I thought, gosh, I bet all of our students feel that way at some time or another. And I think that's exacerbated, of course, through social media and seeing folks seemingly having either a better time or are more connected. So it is that constant comparison. The final piece I wanna just briefly touch on is of course many of our campuses are becoming, uh, thankfully, a lot more diverse in a lot of different ways, racially, ethnically, socioeconomically, culturally, and that brings with it a host of um, benefits and challenges, especially for student belonging. So when students start to look around and say, gosh, I don't look like others, or I don't maybe think like others, or I don't dress like others. There's questions and seeds and saying, huh, do I belong here? Um, and that's really critical. I, I'm thinking of one of our international students who told me once, uh, and their students' relationships are so important to them, and they live, many of them live with roommates, and so this student, uh, was telling me about how her roommate had said to her at one point, oh, I just, I'm constantly distracted from my studies, you know, never able to get done what I want. And this student uh, saw her roommate trying to work, but on social media. And so in her culture, when you care about somebody, you say something to them. So this student said to her roommate, she said, hey, you told me you want to be effective and efficient. I see that you know, you're, you're distracted on social media. And her roommate was aghast. I can't believe you said that to me. Mind your own business. And this student was so taken aback because the way you care about somebody in her culture was to say something. And I think it was just a small example of our students navigating 
How do I become close to somebody? What does that even look like and how different it is for different students um, from different cultures, different perspectives, different experiences? So I will end there. Yeah. Thank you, Angela. Uh, let me give you a prompt. Uh, how do we become more alert to when students don't belong? And what can we do to be a catalyst for helping them connect to the learning community? Give you about 10 minutes. Here's tables. to some of the challenges that our students feel that are extracurricular and it's going to be provided by uh, Sonia Welch who is the coordinator of academic advising at Westmont. She teaches a course on a course for students on probation so she knows a lot about the struggles they face including some of the struggles they face externally. So Sonia. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So when I was asked to talk about some of the anxiety and pressures that students may have outside the classroom I was like where do I start? <laughs> um, this list um, looks different for every single student and what they bring to the campus. So I thought I would give you a little glimpse of some of the things that you may already be aware of, but I also th was hoping that I could share some facts with you about some things that we may not talk on a daily basis about our students. Um, you know, we are very aware of the financial burden that students have on our campus, um, especially with scholarships and being able to have a certain GPA and what that looks like. And if they go below a GPA, can they stay at the campus? And along with that financial burden is the pressure of working. Some of our students work, you know, 20 to 30 hours a week. And that's on top of their academics. That's a lot of pressure and a lot of anxiety that goes along with that. Um, when students go through a tragic event, whether it was in their past or a current tragic event, how, do they have the coping mechanisms to um, go through that, to go through that process? Um, the social atmosphere, Angela talked about that a little bit. Um, even having a new roommate, does that roommate look like you? Um, when I was a, a college student, um, my student my roommate, she was an only child. That was very hard for us. We could not relate to each other at all. Um, we had to navigate that. Um, so being able to be aware and being equipped even in the residence halls. Um, also being plagued with guilt or stress. Some of our students feel very guilty going to college. They might be first gen students and they may feel that they have to live in two different worlds, whether it's you know, on campus and then they go home on the weekends to support and help their, their family um, uh, work. So having to navigate that. Um, as Mark said, students are on probation. These students are on, um, on probation. They have to work not just to meet the standard, they have to work a little bit harder in their academics and how do they um, work on that? Do they feel very anxious to get their grades up? And what is our role in that with um, being in student affairs professionals? Also, student athletes. They may feel that they have to perform on and off the field and in and out of the classroom. So one student a couple weeks ago was sharing with me that when he was on the soccer field, all he could think about was his homework. But when he was doing his homework, all he could think about was being on the soccer field mm -hmm. and he didn't know how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, helping them walk through that process. I also wanted to bring up the role that parents have, whether it's a positive or a negative thing um, as students are communicating with their, with their family. On an average, students contact their parents 13 times a week. So that looks completely different than what we may have done. 25% um, of students think that they should call their parents every day. 24% um, think that they should call their parents a few times a week. Um, so as we're talking to students, they may not feel that they can make a decision unless they run it by their parents. So as I'm talking to my students, they may feel like they can't pick a class because they want to see if that will work with their, with their parents. And I will close with this fact about 
um, the type of population we have on our have on our campus. 30 to 50 percent of our students are introverts. So how do we support our in our introverts? What kind of programming do we have? Do we let them process um, between classes? Sometimes when I'm talking to students, um, sometimes students want to you know, put all their classes all on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, back to back. And, and our introverts, sometimes they need a break between classes to be able to think about um, what they just learned and to prepare themselves for the next class. So thinking about our academic advising model that we have on our campus. And also empowering them with the strengths that they do have. How are they creating their brand? Are they using social and um, uh, uh, me media, like their LinkedIn? That could be their brand. That could be a great way for students to create um, their brand as an introvert. And what does our programming look on campus? So there's just some thoughts um, for our next um, table talk. Good, Th thank you, Sonia. So you got some good questions. How do we serve our introverts? How do we serve those who are overwhelmed by external pressures? All right, I always hate to cut short good conversation, but uh, I do want to make sure that we have sufficient time to get down to the chapel and hear Jocko's uh, presentation. I want to thank all our presenters, and uh, th yeah, thank you. And, and to thank all of you, introverts and extroverts, for participating so robustly in the conversation.